Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast series two. Now, today's guest is an entrepreneur who has run over 1,500 events and is the owner and operator of the biggest rugby festival in the world, the Bournemouth Sevens. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Roger Woodall. Hello, mate. How oh, you doing? Very well. Good. You're looking young and, and sexy as ever. Trying to keep fit, mate. You're looking very sharp. Yeah, I feel it, mate. I feel good. Maybe lockdown. I think it's refreshed a lot of people. I know it was really important to say this because I have to caveat because context is lost. For some people, lockdown has been hell. I know it has actually been fundamentally difficult for your business stuff. But actually, a lot of people are like feeling a bit healthy, a bit more refreshed, Mate, out I've, of the grind. I've enjoyed lockdown. I've enjoyed what's gone on this last year. We can go into that. But yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's totally reset. It calmed everything, allowed us to create new businesses, allowed us to focus. Yeah, there's lots of positives come out of it. Getting to do stuff that you've never done before. 100%, mate. I've done, I've done more in this past year than I've done probably in 10 years. Stuff that I would never think about doing. You know, from podcasting to going on people's shows to going on TV. The, 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 it's, it's been nuts. Because all the stuff that you people said that, we just don't have time. Because yeah. in the real world, we don't have time. Yeah. There is no excuse for you sitting on your ass yeah, at home mate. to say you yeah, haven't mate. got time. 100%, mate. So I wanted to talk to you today about kind of being an entrepreneur. I'm, you know, I always interview people that I'm fascinated with as to like what they're about, how they do things, how they achieve things, um, you know, even if it's kind of left to field stuff. But you and I were talking beforehand about, um, you used to own a monkey. <laughs> and, I, and I, okay, I need you to start from the beginning. Just explain to everybody, first of all, who you are and what it is you do. Yeah, I've been in, I've been, uh, I've been in the events world all my life. I grew up in pubs in London um, and... You grow up at a very, very quick rate. You come streetwise very, very quickly. Um, you know, I grew up seeing, you know, we were in a really busy pub on the Thames and there was a nightclub next door. And my old man was the main face around the play, around the town. And, and yeah, you just grow up very quickly. You see lots of wheeling and dealing going on in the pub. You see lots of, I saw a lot of characters, naughty characters, people doing all sorts of things kids shouldn't see. You know, obviously back then there was bouncers on the door, so I was hanging around with them as a 10-year-old, 8-year-old, 10-year-old growing up and seeing what they're getting up to, and half of them have written books now. And But, yeah, it was a very, very different upbringing. But it's only it's only now, since being in COVID, been this whole lockdown, that I've realised and looked back on my podcast to tell the story because I just thought it was the norm, you know. And, um, yeah, it was just for me, I just loved the buzz, absolutely loved it. Living above a two-bed flat with a nightclub next door, it wasn't your regular upbringing as a kid of going to bed at seven and eating dinner with mum and dad. And it, you know, I was just, I was up till eleven, eleven thirty every night, and then that's just the way it was. Hanging around, the, yeah, just, just seeing how I can earn a pound note at a young age. Was that everything about it? Trying to earn the money, trying to make the cash? Because, because when we talked about it um, outside the studio, you, you know, you were saying about this kind of adventure in this, in this childhood. Were you always destined to be a wheeler and a dealer because of that kind of? Because being an entrepreneur is essentially a wheeler and a dealer. Being an entrepreneur is seeing opportunities that other people don't see and acting upon them. That's essentially what it is, and, and solving problems. You know, and at a young age, it wasn't a, you know, I was seeing people, back then there was no, it wasn't cool back then to be an entrepreneur. People back in the 80s and 90s didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was. It's only become cool in the last five years where every rock star and footballer wants to be an entrepreneur. But when I was growing up, everyone wanted to be a footballer or a rock star or a DJ. Now everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, you know, so it's gone full circle, but... You know, my entrepreneur spirit started at a very young age. You know, mum and dad were always entrepreneurial, you know. Um, my old mum was from Manchester, my dad was from East London. Um, and, yeah, I was just started to earn money. I was seeing all these, like, 800 people in dad's pub, a nightclub next door. And as a 10-year-old, I'd go to the nightclub next door, the manager, on Saturday afternoon and buy 20 tickets off him for a pound each. So I'd come down in the pub, and back then people would drink at between 7pm and 11pm and then go to a nightclub. So about 10 o'clock at night, I'd have these 20 tickets and I'd go around the pub selling them for two quid. But my tickets got them VIP queue jump. So they wouldn't have to go up into the queue for 800,000 people in the queue of the nightclub. They would buy their tickets off me. Everyone was a winner. I was winning. The customers were winning. And the manager was winning next door. But these tickets got them VIP queue jump. So everyone, it was just a win-win situation. And it started from there. I knew that business was about creating win-win situations. And when you're in an environment like that as a kid... There were just opportunities everywhere, you know, at the back of the pub, because there was so much walk-by trade because it was on the River Thames. The back of the pub, there was a WH Smith, and they had these massive skips. And me and my best pal, Chris, uh, we'd, we'd go in the skip, we'd go skip diving. He'd hold on to my ankles. I'd get these massive big toys out that WH Smith used to... If there was a little chip on them, they would just put them in the skips. I think, these are like 20 quid toys. Okay, so we set up a stand at the back of the pub, all the walk-by trade, bum bag on, and start selling, sell, selling all the toys and stuff. And that's just how it was. You know, and Maybank holiday, 
We'd, we'd go to the cash and carry and we'd buy 500 quid's worth of hot dogs and 500 quid's worth of uh, ice cream. And depending on the weather, you know where you're going to sell all the hot dogs. Or if it's a boiling hot day on Maybank holiday outside the pub, you can sell all the ice creams. You know, and as a kid then, you're coming out 600 quid profit after a weekend. You know, you're talking, you know, even even selling the tickets as a 10-year-old, 20 quid in an hour's work as a 10-year-old back then, you thought you were a multi-millionaire, you know. Your £10 coins, your £20 coins, and you go and uh, change them up to Dad and get the notes every Saturday night, 11 o'clock. You know, and that's just what how it was. What did you do with the money? What did you do with the money with that age? Because I never had pocket money. My parents never gave me anything, so no, I wouldn't I know what to do with it. Money. I just used to build this pot of money up. You know, I'd allowed to buy myself going the panini stickers and going to school with flogging panini stickers and swapsies and <laughs> doing people's hair. You know, if they wanted tram lines in there, I'd do their three quid and an extra quid for a tram line. And it was just, you know, and that was outside of outside of school, you know, and inside of school, I'd be earning a pound note inside of school as well. So, <laughs> Mate, I, I cannot, like, when yeah. I came to talk to you about this, I knew it was, like, going to be interesting, but I had no idea that it was, like... You know, it was such a wheeler and a dealer route. So that's, that's unbelievable. Like what? But you know, whether there's any downside to that kind of upbringing, because you, as you said, you probably didn't know that it was not normal until you then reflect on it. Was there anything, ba- anything bad about that? Anything that you look back and go, oh, I would change that? No, 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 no. I absolutely loved it, Hask. Literally loved it. But I knew no different. All I knew is when I go to other kids' houses, mum and dad would be cooking dinner together. They'd all be on a sofa and it'd be calm. There'd be no music. There'd be no noise. There'd be no. You know, there'd be you wouldn't see people fighting outside their house, as you would do <laughs> yeah. in the pub. You're seeing people having tear ups, and and it was a very different upbringing. And when I used to go to their house, I used to go, "Oh, this is calm." Yeah. And when I come back into our environment, you know, there's a lot of alcohol, alcohol fueled people. You know, thousands of them coming through the doors in and out characters, and I was always in the pub chatting to adults, and I just loved it. You know, but um, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's only now I've had a time to reflect and look at. What, what our childhood was like, you know. Do you think that social kind of experience of talking to people has made you the way, the way you are? Because, you know, I see kids, a lot of kids can't communicate because they're glued to their phones. You know, one of the biggest things that people find in, you know, I think, the corporate world is teaching people to present to yeah. crowds because nobody can do it anymore because everyone's just, you know, they can they can write really well, they can learn really well, they can watch stuff really well, but they yeah. can't be articulate. Yeah. Is that where you find your kind of ability came from? Yeah, you're a people's person. You're around people the whole time. You know, I learnt my trade there as a kid. I watched body language. I watched how people were operating, you know, and you saw the doorman wheeling and dealing on Saturday night because they were the main faces going into their cars and selling whatever they're selling. And dude, you just saw everything. Then then, then you'd go up with the doorman into the nightclub as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old and they would protect you and look after you. Cause my old man and mum would go, yeah, don't worry, you're with, you're with all the security, security and doorman and then they'll drop me off at three o'clock in the morning, come back home and that's just the way it was. You know, my bedroom, there was one wall between my bedroom and the nightclub. You know, so every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it was the DJ on the mic, everyone stamping their feet, come on, Eileen. So my sleep patterns were zero, you know, so it's just the way it was. And, you know, we had, so people would come out of the nightclub. This is funny. <laughs> people would come out of the night. I'd earn my money before they got to the nightclub. They would come out, say if I went to bed at 11.30 as a young kid. And at two o'clock, they'd all pile out of the club, screaming and shouting. That would wake me up after all the music banging anyway. Then that would wake up the the, uh, the then that would wake up the two uh, Alsatians and Doberman we had who were guard dogs. They would start barking because there was everything going on. That would wake you up. And then five o'clock the drayman would come in with all the barrels. You've heard barrels being rolled on <laughs> yeah, bloody. I, have. I don't know what. Mate, I have, yeah. yeah, but that. And then that would wake up our cockatoo. We had we had a cockatoo called Bubbles. We're all West Ham fans. It was called Bubbles, and it was sing every morning. I'm forever blowing bubbles. I'm forever blowing bubbles. <laughs> Fucking hell! That would yeah. wake that would wake up the pet monkey we had. <laughs> Shut <laughs> the <laughs> fuck up! God, you're you. talking shit. Now. You had a monkey. I promise you, mate. Called Mitzi. <laughs> we- <laughs> Why is it called Mitzi? I don't know. Dad, I'll ask Dad. But we had a pet monkey, and we also had God knows how many budgie regards as well. A monkey. Yes, a monkey. A, a monkey. A, a, squirrel, like- a squirrel monkey. About this big squirrel monkey, uh, and you would clean, you would clean it, and it go up to the fire. We'd had a little, one of those little fires, and it. it would just shake itself like that, and turn its butt, turn its round, and shake its bum on the fire. Shut <laughs> up. Promise you, mate. I mean, I mean, how did that come about? How did you have a monkey in a pub Dad, in London? Dad just loved animals, and you know, he just loved animals, and he should have been, you know, working on a farm somewhere yeah. or doing something like that. But he just loved animals, so he knew he had to make ends meet to give me a nicer upbringing. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, and, and that's what they did. They end up, you know, they were working in Mayfair as he was a croupier, so was my mum in the casinos in London in the in the seventies. The whole you know, that's what they did. They moved into the pub trade. And they were trying to make ends meet, and he just wanted to have his animals with him. So we, <laughs> that's what we had. <laughs> did he? Did he um, encourage you to do what you were doing, or did they? Did they try to tell you, "Come on, no, wind it in"? No, 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 no. Very much, I had so much freedom as a kid. Oh, really? Oh, huge, huge amounts of freedom, and belief. They gave me a lot of belief as a kid. Yeah, Dodge, go and do it. Yeah, go on, go and give it a go. Do you want to go and do that and sell that? Go and give it a go. You want to go to experience that? Go on, go and give it a go. Really? Yeah, hundred percent. So much freedom and so, so much uh, belief. And that's something a lot of kids don't get given these days is believing in themselves. Yeah. You know? And I guess that's had a knock-on effect of my career and what, what's gone on. Did you ever get in trouble uh, as a kid? Because obviously selling bits... I mean, A, a what I mean by trouble is... Did someone turn around and go, hold on a minute, you're scalping the stuff off the back here and bollock you, and then do you get in trouble with the police for flogging dodgy hot dogs and you know, bits no, and pieces? No, they weren't no. dodgy hot oh, dogs. Oh, no, you know it what I a, mean, but just like... Yeah, it was a proper stand outside the pub on the River Thames where everyone all walk by trade would go by. So, no, but at school I was always... You know, I'd go to Blackbush. So, it, it's, <laughs> so this was in the pub. Yeah. And I was lucky enough. My old man and mum didn't want me to be around that the whole time, the pub world. Fine. So they sent me to a private school. So I was a Londoner going to a private school. <laughs> yeah. It was a shock for my system. And it's yeah. a shock for their system. Mugging off a lot of public school people like <laughs> yeah. me. Yeah, yeah like yeah, you're not. Yeah, 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 <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. It wasn't. It was great. And they went there. They knew I was good at sport. Not and... a lot of tram lines in my neck of the woods, mate. Hello, what's you your had, tram line? Did you have a uh, quiffs and curtains? <laughs> I did, well, yeah. I, mate, I've had, never had enough hair to have any fucking quiffs and curtains. But I can tell you something. No one's ever gone, do you want to wear a pair of Adidas poppers and get a tram line? I thought a tram line is literally where a tram came on until, you, until I realised it was like doubling your eyebrows. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, mate, so I went to a private school, and it was like a double life, if I'm honest with you. I go to private school in the day, have all the best facilities, play sport. I was never academic in the classroom. I didn't really enjoy that. I was always thinking, how I could earn a pound note, really, because <laughs> yeah. there was 400 kids there all of a sudden. I was thinking, pound a man? You know, and that that's what my mum taught me as a young kid. It was a pound a man, and it kind of grew from there, and I would, you know, I'd go to school, and I'd go to Black, Blackbush Market and buy 100 Timberland jumpers for a tenner. I'd go to school on a Friday. I'd go to school and kids would get their pocket money on a Friday, and I'd sell, you know, a hundred jumpers to the kids at thirty quid, you know. So it was like a grand, grand a week, and then it would change the Adidas hoodies. Or it was just amazing that as the schools from three hundred kids to four hundred kids, and then moving to university, the numbers just got bigger, and as so did my personal businesses within the school, got bigger. It grew. I'm fascinated the fact that to have that mentality to go. I'm, I can I can sell to these people a pound a man and actually select something to buy. I, it's never occurred to me to go. I'll go to Blackbush Market and buy something to to sell it. But I love that's the way you're thinking. I mean, just the way it was. Just always trying to make you some money. Oh, well, that's you know when you grow up in what you grow up with. Yeah. It was it was I was around lots of cash as a kid, seeing everything. It was just the just what I knew. I didn't know any different. It was just like okay, well, I'm going to create women situations here. Kids want the Timberland hoodies. I can get them Timberland hoodies for that price, and I'll sell them to that price. They're happy. He's happy. I'm happy. It's a win-win, and that's all I've done across business for the last thirty odd years. Is it the is it the money or is it the the mechanics? The of, buzz. The buzz. The buzz to create a win-win. So I know that person's super happy. I know that person's super happy, and I'm super happy. But also to also knowing you're earning money as well as a young age, and it's getting bigger as as you're getting older. The money's getting bigger and bigger. It was a wonderful feeling. But what did you do with it? Like, because I know, for example, when I when I since I retired, I'm not in you know in, in a wealthy position at all. But I there's some, certain material things I wanted to get and achieve. Yeah. Which I got, and then I realised, you know what? I actually much prefer experiences and doing things Same. as opposed to material things. Like a lot of mates got, my, you know, I got myself a nice watch. I was like, I don't wear it. I wear a fucking Apple Watch. You know, I got a nice car. I like it. It's fine. It's fast, but it's you know, it doesn't. It, mm. I, I take it or leave it. Mm. I wonder with yourself when you had a bit of money, what what did you spend on as a kid? Were you just trying try, try to date ladies? Just taking, a, you know, was I what, just, what did you I do? Just, I just, I just to save it. Really? Yeah, and build the pot up because I just wanted a comfy home. Fine. When I was a kid, you weren't. I wasn't. I wasn't living in comfort. You know, it was. It was a lot of toxicity going on yeah. growing up in this environment. But I didn't know any different. But what I did know is when I went to people's houses and it was calm and nice right. and comfy. I was like, oh, this is lovely. And that's all I wanted growing up was to have comfort. That's all I wanted. I wanted a home. I wanted a house. You know, and um, it kind of it, it grew from there. I had this goal of just being comfortable. You know, simple things, like thick carpets. 
Yeah. Real comfy sofas. No noise. No noise. No yeah. fucking noise, mate. No, no monkeys. No barrels no, down no, the street. Exactly. No, no fighting. Bird, no yeah. birds squawk, squawking. Yeah. You know, just just yeah. it was it was madness, but it was it was wonderful. It was is there, wonderful. Is there, a, is there a point where you've the first moment where you actually got that? Where you bought your own house? Is, is there a moment you can put your finger on and say, "I've actually achieved what I wanted to achieve"? Well, I went, I went, I went after my schooling and stuff, and my mum was said, "Pound a man." I went to school. There was four hundred kids, and then it was like, I went to Loughborough Sports University. You know, I was like, "Oh my god, there's twelve thousand kids here. This is like a dream come true." I was just like, "What can I sell? What can I do? What can I?" You know, it was just amazing feeling. So, yeah, that's what happened, mate. Did anyone, did anyone ever say in your report card? Roger would do better if he stopped trying to sell money in wheel. Did, did ever did any teachers ever pick up on it? Concentration. All come to con- dodge. There was always dodge. All he wants to do is play sport. All he wants to do is have a laugh. All he wants to do is muck about and make people laugh and have fun. Right. Okay. You know, and create funny environments and take the Mickey and, and just be a happy chappy. You know, and uh, that's how it, what it was. But they, the teachers knew what I was up to because going back to that Timberland story is a funny one. So obviously, you as a sportsman, you're always in with it, the head head of rugby or the coach or whatever. And on a Sunday, all the kids at school were allowed to wear what they wanted. And literally like a hundred kids turned up in the same Timberland jump on when they're getting their dinner in the food hall. <laughs> and But they knew what I was up to, yeah. you know, and he kept, he, the, the headmaster, the uh, director of rugby and stuff kept Sturm and they knew, they knew, but they knew I was a nice character Fine. with it. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't nasty with it. I was just a good fun, fun lad with it, you know. You, you know, you talk about to- toxicity. It's interesting. So when, when I've interviewed people on this podcast before, right, a lot of people's recipe for success comes from things that happened to them when they were younger so i.e i I was successful in rugby because i didn't have a lot of confidence in myself and that i fought to deal with that i fought to prove people wrong and that became my recipe for success if you don't address your recipe for success it can also undo you because then you don't address your confidence did you does the toxicity and stuff is that ever come home to roost do you ever look now and go and fuck up you know that that's affected me or did you manage to kind of compartmentalize that away i didn't know oh, really? i just okay. carried on with life fine okay i was happy i was like duh, duh, duh. i was earning it was great and as i was getting older things were getting better fine you know when you went to uh, loughborough university you're away from home you're away from that environment you're up at you know a sports campus yeah with twelve thousand people like-minded people who want to party get on the beers play sport pull dance yeah. laugh and that's what it was on campus and uh that's when my you know proper events world started you know how, how did you get started in the events world because obviously you're wheeling and dealing and making a you know a pound a pound a man what what was your first event that you run where you thought actually hold on it i like this this is this is where i want to be yeah well it was it was in my final year at uni um and i went to the local nightclub and from a kid like I was saying, pound a man, pound a man. There was 12,000 people there. It was a local nightclub. And on a Wednesday night, they had a sports night. And then you were like one of the main faces on campus, rugby boy, da, da, da. I went to the club and said, look, you're charging two quid here. Why don't we make it three quid? I keep a pound. You keep two pound. And I'll get your numbers from 1,000 to 2,000 people because I can drag more people from the student union into this club. And they agreed it. So my final year, I walked straight into a grand a week cash. I got the numbers up to 2,000 every week. So I got two grand cash. From that one nightclub in Loughborough, Echo's nightclub. <laughs> so I was coming out with two grand a week cash from that club from September all the way through to the year. I also had another club in Wandsworth um, called Liquid Nightclub on a Tuesday night. And that was a £1,000. I would drive down on a Tuesday, click, take the door money and drive back up on a Wednesday while at uni. So I was coming out with three grand cash a week in <laughs> 1999. Oh, my God. Yeah, as a 21-year-old, 20, you know. And that's just the way it was. And it was, I then saw a huge gap in the market. So that was every single week. And I tell you, what, it was a Tuesday night. All the Wasp boys used to come down, all the London Irish boys, uh, all the Harlequins boys on the Tuesday. That was their big piss up, you know, of all the Roehampton students. But I saw a huge gap in the market and I wanted to be pioneer. And it kind of developed from their hask, really, mate, because when I finished, I knew I'd be unemployable. I knew that I would never go and get a job. I just couldn't. I haven't got the attention span to go and get a job. And I just knew that I saw a gap in the market and I was like, Right, in year 2000, I then put a big gig on in Ministry of Sound. Um, thousand people in Ministry, going to risk that, going to hire it. And you remember, it was like, back then I thought it might, they might charge me like a... You know, they were, I was calling them up saying, I want to hire you, want to hire you. They're like, Mate, tell that bloke to go, a young cad, lad who is he? And that was like the best nightclub in the world back then. Yeah, yeah. Year 2000, it was like the club to be at. And I was like, I need that club. I need to get that club. And I was thinking it's going to be a grand. And they ignored me, ignored me. I phoned them probably three times a day for 21 days. 
I was literally like a dog with a slipper. You ain't getting away. I'm going to be on you, on you, on you until I get it. And in the end, they were like, for fuck's sake, can we get him away? Just have a meeting with him. So they come in and said, um, okay, if you want the club on the Thursday night, uh, it's £5,000, £5,700 plus VAT. I looked at my best mate. I was like, what's VAT? That was the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> but also five seven. I was thinking, Jesus Christ, that is a fortune. And straight yeah. away, went, I love it. We'll take it. So we took the Ministry of Sound gig and put on the London Student Ball in year 2000. And it was the best experience ever. To know that you're putting on a party in ministry as a young kid and owning it and smashing it. It was, it was brilliant. And that's where the journey then went on to because that was the journey of seeing the opportunity and seeing, well, okay, how can we scale this business up? You know, so I created a brand in year 2000, a student brand, and said, I don't want to get a job. How can I get more nightclubs? Because I know what I'm doing with those two nightclubs, the London and Loughborough. If I've got another nightclub, I've got one in Leicester then. So I had three nightclubs every week, you know, and that was like, it was just amazing feeling. So I created a brand when the dot-com boom started. So in dot-com in 2000, I created a brand called popyourcherry.com. <laughs> okay, yeah. Perfect for the students. Yeah, perfect for the students, yeah. So do you know the Pasha logos? Yes. So I took the Pasha logos and tweaked them slightly and called it popyourcherry.com. Yeah. So then that was the brand that we used to scale up and we got up to 12 parties every week all around the country, every single week, from Manchester to London to Brighton to Leicester to Birmingham to Bournemouth to Oxford to Cambridge. To, to, it, was just, it was just wild. How did you facilitate that then? Because you said obviously um, you didn't have the necessary attention span to, 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 to you know for work to someone, but that requires a lot of like attention to details, a lot of moving parts. Attention span is very different to go and working for someone, sitting in a class when someone's teaching you history or yeah. scripture yeah. or double yeah. English. You know, attention span when I was creating businesses and creating win-win situations, that was exciting, and knowing that I could be the pioneer of these student nights that go national, that was exciting. You got to remember back then. The clubs that I was taking was anywhere between, you know, 1,500 people to 3,000 people. The super clubs in your Kingstons and your Oceanas and your big ones in Birmingham. Because the more, more people you got through the door, the more money you took as a promoter. You know, they'd take the bar money and I'd go to the nightclub and say, look, you're closed on a Wednesday. You've got a club closed there on a Wednesday and a Tuesday. Why don't you give me the club for free? I'll pack in 2,000 students. I'll take the door money. You take the bar money. Win-win. Students would win. I put loads of entertainment on for them. And that's what we did. And we saw a gap in the market and we, we went for it. Was, so the Ministry of Sound was the first thing that you, you pulled off and you thought to yourself, oh, this is, I can do this now? The first thing we pulled off was the, in my final year, the two student, oh, sorry, nights. student nights. And then that was from September to July 1999, come to 2000. The August of 2000, that's when we did the Ministry gig. The September, that's when we scaled up the business to go national. And what was it like running a national business like that? It was It was... Me and my mobile. Really? Yeah, mate. So I would set up teams in these major cities. I'd set up teams of uh, the main promoter. Oh, foot soldiers. Foot soldiers. And I'd yeah. have 10 foot soldiers. You know, I'd send up 40,000 flyers to that city, send up 1,000 posters all on billboards with cable ties to go on the lamp posts everywhere. We'd look at farmers' fields and whack up big things in farmers' fields for all the traffic. We'd drive past and see Pop Your Cherry every Wednesday <laughs> night out. What you, we yeah. just, we just, we just knew no different. And we thought, you know, the only we got remember this is before social media ask. Yeah. So this was like proper promoting. This is old school promoting that you were out at two o'clock in the morning, flyering everyone, not on the night of your event, making sure that there was flies under the doors of all the all the halls of residence, making sure all the posters were up all around the city, and you know you have knock on effects of councils and stuff upset and other but that's just the only way we could get the word out that's what i wondered uh, you know what what were the kind of pitfalls of 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 trying to run that were you, were you in your car the whole time on your mobile just driving around checking on people because uh, i mean you do you personally collect the money because i imagine people try to fuck you a lot didn't you, they no one tried to fuck no really which was good yeah they we 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 just we just had a, a nice system in place oh fine yeah so we'd have. I love that. <laughs> Is there something you're not saying? It's a nice because <laughs> you went, you paused, and went. We had a nice system, i.e., there's probably some. <laughs> Mate, we had we had good people. people we had good go... people in places right. in every city. But again, you are right. So if you're in Manchester, I couldn't be in Manchester and Brighton on the same night. Fine. So I'd have three parties on a Monday, three on a Tuesday, oh, three on a Wednesday, and three on a Thursday. You know, so I could only be in two on one night if you're lucky if they're yeah. closer together. So I had family, 
all looking after the ones. You'd have family on the tills. You'd have the head doorman with the clicker, making sure that it, that clicker's ma matching up to the, the door money that's coming in. You know, we're putting on the DJs. We're putting on 10 girls and lads with hot pants and giving out free champagne and sweets and, and freebies all night. And we'd kit out the whole nightclub all in drapes with poppy cho massive great big glitter cherries everywhere and you know really do it properly yeah the students have never seen in their lives and putting on entertainment they've never seen and back then there wasn't influencers but there was like your big brother characters and people coming off telly like the stuff you were doing but mm. that was back then there was no social media yeah. there's no influencers but when they were coming off the show we're getting straight into the clubs and they would have like the students would know there'd be for the first time there's 12 weeks of entertainment all lined up in that club so every week they're piling in. We'd look after all the sports captains. There'd be a thousand people in a queue. You'd pick everyone out and they'd come home and feel special. You'd make people feel special in the VIP queue. And yeah, it was great fun. How, how big did it get? What was the glass ceiling on that? Because I know you said you'd like 1,500 events. Was that? We put on, we put, I put on 1,500 parties in clubs across the UK across that 10 year period before moving in to creating the, the festival, which we moved into. Um, but that was the next step. For the business, you know, I started seeing, in fact, you know, I started seeing that the smoking ban come in in 2006 or seven, I can't remember. And then uh, there was the 24 hour license that come in and all these thoughts, all these things started to start to ring alarm bells to me because what would happen on a night would be, you know, that everyone would go into, you'd say if you went into, I don't know, Birmingham, you know, there'd be 20 bars there where everyone would be doing pre-drinks back then. Everyone would be getting on it in the bars. When they come out the bars, then you've got to, get them and whew, put them all 2000 into a nightclub all of a sudden the bars got these late licenses and the bars were like hold on a minute let's just hold people instead of losing the bar trade at 11 let's hold them to one let's make a little dance floor in here and you know if each bar kept 70 people or 80 people in there or 90 people in there, it's worthwhile for them so that started to come in as well and uh that created a few alarm bells then the smoking ban people would have to go outside your nightclub to smoke a fag in the rain or the cold or whatever. So all these things were sort of little chinks in the armour that were that were not creating a, a, the most amazing experience for the customer or the client, people coming into your club, you know. So then it was like, well, I need to think quickly. And that's when the idea came about creating Bournemouth 7 Sport and Music Festival. So, and so talk to me about that, that the, the festival. You know, was it, did people try and talk you out of it? Do you think this was, this was too big a step? Like what was your mindset around creating this, this, this tournament? Good question. It was uh, naivety. Naivety in business is a brilliant thing, by the way. So I thought, right, I know how to throw an amazing party. I'm well connected with England players and friends of mine all playing for England at the time and celebrities and what have you. Why don't I create a sport music festival in the field? Little did I know what I was going myself into, if I'm honest with you, mate. Little did I know. I jumped in with two feet. I was thinking it's going to cost 100 grand to put on. Um, everyone was telling me I'm mad to do this festival, but but I saw an opportunity again that there was music festivals all around the UK, but there wasn't a sport and music festival, you know, where people, like-minded people like us lot, you know, playing rugby, netball, dodgeball, hockey, volleyball, there are sports today. Like-minded people coming there for a weekend for three days and partying in the field. I thought, I can throw amazing parties. Little did I know about police, council, licensing, uh, fire, the airport next door, marquees, showers, toilets, fencing, audio, Vat. visual. I hope you figured Vat. out that. I found you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, just a Vat man's watching. You found out Vat really early on. We knew you? about that. Yeah. But yeah, so that all come on all come on top. Because I thought, yeah, you know, remember, I didn't have a team still. It was just me. You know, my missus, my wife, bless her, doesn't like risk at all. She was working for JP Morgan in a really sound job, you know. And um, <laughs> I got to a point where I was... In for a hundred grand in our first year in two thousand eight for six months to go, and we ran out of money. Six months to go it was like, oh my god! So that time I was like, just before that happened, I said, Flo, you, you, I can't juggle all of this to put on a music sport music festival. It's too much. It's crazy. It was trying to deal with the press, trying to deal with promoting up at Twickenham, trying to deal with everything. It, everything. It was just way too much. But again, naivety in business is a good thing because I've just like I'm all in. But. When Fleur said, I'm going to leave her job and come and help me, that's a girl that doesn't like risk, you know, and bless her, that it, was, it wasn't long after that when she was paying the bills that we'd actually run out of money because everyone wanted money up front. I was thinking I'm going to pay everyone after the festival. They're like, whoa, 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 you ain't paying us after the festival. You pay us now because you haven't got a track record in festivals. So then 
the obviously I jumped into it when the recession was in 2008 because I saw an opportunity rather than sitting there with fear. No banks were loading money. Who else do you go to for money? I was like, what are, what are the options? And the only option I had to have a chat with, with Fleur, my wife, and say, we've got to remortgage the house. <laughs> Fucking hell. Mate, trust me. Fuck, you trust me. That was one difficult conversation. And two, anyone listening, do not remortgage your house to put on an event in a field for three days. But that's what we did. And we remortgaged the house. But the weird thing is, Hask, is that you still didn't know until the day. So we remortgaged the house. You've got to remember, my missus was in bed crying four or five nights a week. Oh, and what God. the fuck have we done? Yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? Because people back then, remember, wouldn't go online. And you wouldn't put your credit card or your card details in on a computer back in 2008. And go, oh, yeah, I want to buy 15 tickets for me and my pals. And I'm from uh, Manchester. I'm going to bring all my mates down. People wouldn't do it. No. You know, and there was no social media. So it was like on the day you're building up, building up all this pressure building on the day waiting for people to turn up. But luckily, because it's a sport and music festival, the business model business model was different. So the teams all entered. I was thinking 24 teams. I actually got 96 teams in year one. Wow. And then I was thinking, right, I can't have this as a sausage fest. I need women there. So let's bring netball in. So then all these netball teams started coming in and, you know, back then they would write a check and we didn't have offices. They would, a check would land them through our post box each day. Four checks, 10 checks each next day, 16 checks. It was like, oh my God, we're onto something here. But what we didn't know was how many party people were going to turn up. So on the day of the festival, when you pull your curtains back and you're praying that it's not raining because if it's raining, I probably wouldn't be sitting here having this chat with you today. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but, probably wouldn't be married, are yeah, you? Probably, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um... That was all the pressures that went on and, and the pressure of that day of opening the curtains and seeing that it was sunny. And then you've got to remember, it takes two weeks to build the whole festival site, you know, and um, you can make the site as pretty as you want. And you've got all the security in place, 100 security, the police are in place, all the bar staff are in place. You set up all the bars and the marquees and you've got all your DJs there and everyone's waiting for people to turn up. And I don't know who's going to turn up. You know. Serious stress levels through the roof. It's making me stressed thinking about it. <laughs> Mate, it was serious pressure. I don't like to use the word stress, but it was serious, serious pressure. And knowing what I know now, would I do that again? Put myself through that and my wife and everyone? That... No. No, mate. No, 100%. It's interesting you say that because uh, one of the things I want to come on to later on when we chat is, is some of the lessons that you've you learned. But it's interesting because it was a success, but you wouldn't you wouldn't do it again or along those. I know you do it differently, maybe. I would do it again now because I've got a pound note to do it. Fine. With. So yeah. if you lose half a bar or six underground, da, 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 you can take it on the chin yeah. more than you you could when your house is on the line yeah. Yeah. 13, 14 years ago. Because um, I know people close to me have done exactly that and fucked it. Mate, and, I, and, and put the house on to set stuff up and fucked it. Yeah. And and, and the bank just, they just come for your house. Yeah. Come for everyone. Oh, take, yeah, but imagine if no one turned up or no. 100 people turn up. Our house is gone. Yeah. You have to go and rent a flat or something. Yeah. No. So that, that sh you know what? That I was doing ridiculous hours and I was just at it. I, we were up flying. I would get I would get four loads of students from Bournemouth. We'd drive up to Twickenham every Six Nations game. Yeah. They'd dress up as super women, hot uh, boob tubes, skirt, fly, um, capes. We'll have rucksack of flyers. All the blokes would be dressed as Superman. We're going to, you know, with West Carpet. Yeah, yeah. I was drinking and booze. Flying everyone. Everyone that moved, all the cars, all the all the windscreen wipers, the car just blitz everyone at Twickenham because there was no social media back then. Yeah, who's going to know about Bournemouth Sevens Festival? So then we get chased by all the security at Twickenham. <laughs> it was like Benny Hill, like did did did, like running around. I was hiding in the toilets, taking yeah. off all the stuff, back on again. But that was our only opportunity. Every home international game to really get the word out there. What was the relief like? What was that? You know, when when you saw people turning up. Oh. Well, at what point did you think we've done this? This is all right. The relief was when I saw a massive queue of people and all the taxis turning up. Of I didn't know where these people were coming from. That was like, oh my god! But I didn't know the numbers. Was it a thousand? Was it two thousand? Was it three thousand? But I didn't know. And you also don't know when they're in there how much they're going to spend on the bar. Right. So it was all the unknown. I didn't have a business model to replicate because there was no sport or music festivals out there. Did you try to speak to some festival owners to do the festival part and get an idea or did you just go in straight into it? I was just straight in. Fucking hell. Mate, like, for rule number one is go and find someone who's doing what you want and better and ask them how to do it. You mate, can do it. I was just balls, mate. I was all chips in. Really? Yeah, 100%. But I've got another story to, to move on from that. Yeah. 
but um, about going to speak to someone. But that was a couple of years Fine. later. Um, but yeah, so that's just the way it was, and it, it, it took. And year one, most most. So Melvin Ben, going back to your thing, uh, is owns Reading Festival, Leeds Festival, some other festivals, and owns Festival Republic, who are part of Live Nation. He's probably the king of festival promoters. He come down on the second year. He flew in from Kenya, did a cycle ride. He said, I need to see this because I I'm owed you up to something here. Yeah? The rumours are flying around the country. Come on down, come as our guest. And I said to him, What would you what would you do and tweak? He went, Do not change a single thing. And that stuck with me for the last 13, 14 years. And what he meant by that, he can't believe the amount of people that come to our festival, thirty thousand. We don't go with a big headline, big acts and spend two million quid on acts and three million quid on them. I had 300 grand and 200 grand and that DJ. We don't do that for us. And for what the goal was from the start was to all about the experience of like minded people having fun in a field for three days. And that's what we stuck by the whole of these 13, 14 years. How many people turned up to the first one? Can you remember? I can't quite remember to the dot. I think right. it was like 4,000. Four, five thousand, or something, and that was amazing. When you're seeing that, did you recoup the cash? So in year one, so yeah. going back to the thing, Melvin Ben said to me, "I said, when did how long did it take for music festivals to break even? Just music festivals?" Yeah. He said to me, seven years." Oh my god! Yeah, you probably should have found that out before. <laughs> you <laughs> should have found yeah. that before. So year one, yeah, it cost three hundred grand to put on. I don't mind telling this. It's yeah, years fine. Ago. It cost three hundred grand to put on, and we made a thousand pound profit. <sighs> Which, if you think you work a whole year, you think, fucking great. Yeah. But then you look back at what Melvin Ben said, it takes yeah. seven years to break even. That was phenomenal. Phenomenal. So then I knew I was onto something. So then the, the difficulty was, year, year one was a lot of pressure. Year two was even more pressure because the naivety I didn't know was, I said, oh, I can have a whole summer off now. And God, happy day. Well, you've made a grand. And what happens? Shit, you've got a plan for next year. So we were straight in planning again for next year. So there was no break. There was no stop. There was no nothing. Oh, just to throw on top of that, we got married three weeks after our, the first festival. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mate, so it was full on crazy, crazy pressure. Um, but year two was harder. People say year one was harder. Year one was harder. But year two was harder because I'm always constantly improving and tweaking the business model. Because I was learning the business model. There's no one to copy. So then it was like, I want to make better experience. I want... Better toilets, better showers, better sound systems, better walkways, better marquees, bigger marquees, dance tents, more marquees, more a VIP, champagne tent. I just wanted more of everything. But that comes at a cost. Yeah. So then the next year costs four hundred and fifty grand to put on. So then you're working at some going, I need another I need another three thousand people to break even. So you're constantly chasing the people to making sure the business model works. But what we knew was that this was a real Big bar spend. People spend a lot of money at sport and music festivals, you know, you know. People love to get on the beers and have a laugh. Whereas more music festivals, there might be one pint here and a pint there and yeah. a wander over there. But this was a full on party where everyone's in fancy dress and having a great crack and it's seventy percent women. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you raised drive up. I mean that says it all, yeah. Yeah. But I that's know. just how it's... it was, mate. And uh... were there any um any bits on that kind of first festival where you thought, fuck, how, how have I missed that? I'll give you an example of why. So I set up a supplement range um, and I had a, had, a, had a fat burner called uh, Hades. And and, and actually, <laughs> bizarrely, it got Men's Health Sports Supplement of the Year and we did a right out of it initially. But when we first went to our very first event, got this amazing stand at um, the NEC Birmingham for Body Power yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I remember turning up and everything looked brilliant. I remember looking at my dad and going, we haven't put what the fucking hell it is. <laughs> and, he went, and he went, what do you mean? And I said, well, we've got brands. Said, this brand is Hades. Everything else looks great. And I said, well, but it doesn't, it doesn't say what's on the thing. It doesn't say it's a fat burner. Yeah. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, we don't, we haven't, we've missed, because we know what it is. Yeah. We've talked about it, but nobody, it's not on the brand. I said, people just don't know what it is. Mm. So we had to get stickers. And the lot on the day, I spotted it and I went, let's get this company to come in and print stickers to stick it on everything to say fat burner, change your body. Yeah. And it was like, because you're so close to it, you don't see it. I know it sounds a bit naive, but it can happen. Was there any moments like that for you? <laughs> yeah. That like what? That like what? <laughs> in year one, right? I'll say it because, yeah. In year one, I thought, 
Because I was quite a ballsy character back then. Like, I just didn't really. What do you mean back then? But you were just a ballsy <laughs> character. But I was just, I was just like, I don't care. Let's, yeah. let's get. I need to get the word out of there. Yeah. So the Bournemouth Sevens logo yeah. is a seven, as you mm. know. It's got Bournemouth and it's got the seven. What I did, I changed the seven to a Superman logo. Right. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to put this Superman logo everywhere. Printed, you know, seven hundred thousand flyers. Printed everything up. Did everything we could. Put it everywhere. Fly it everywhere. But I knew, I was thinking, oh, my God, Warner Brothers, if they see this, I'm in serious shit. Yeah. But I didn't care because I thought I needed I need a brand logo to, that everyone can relate to. So the same colours. That's why I had all the girls running around in Superman. Same, same colours, same colors. same everything. Honestly, what? with a little tweak, but there was a little tweak yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, the Apache logo, a little yeah, tweak. tweak yeah. yeah, a tiny little yeah. tweak. And I remember, um, I remember the flyers were out there. Obviously, I knew I was doing a good job in promoting all the different cities, getting the word out that brought Bournemouth Sevens. And then one day, come home, there was a letter on the floor, and I picked up this really heavy letter on the most expensive envelope with a rubber gold rubber stamp at the top. It said Warner Brothers. Oh. I was like, <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> shit! So I remember opening it up, and it was just stamped, and it was a lawyer's letter saying, "I've seen that you're using our logo with a little tweak. We're going to take you to court if this doesn't change straight away. I want everything changed." Da, da, da. Obviously, hands in the air, phoned up the lawyer. I was like, acted, mate, I'm so sorry. Naivety again. Yeah. Well, kind of not. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Getting yeah. the word out. Obviously, got the word out there, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, he was really nice. But I said, what happens? And he said, we get employed fully to look out for people like yourselves or using any sort of Warner Brothers stuff without it being copy. Obviously, it's been copywritten yeah. and stuff. And yeah, so all those flyers had to go to waste and posters and where we had to reprint a load more again to go around the country. But, but once they were out, you can't you can't put the I cat said back in the bag. I yeah. said to him, I said they're out, they're out. Yeah. But to be honest, it, it was such a scary moment. This was year one yeah. with all the other pressures going on. <laughs> <laughs> you know. What was it like with the, the police and stuff? Do you have, do you have any like real? You know, you said learning curves. Is there any like massive learning curves where halfway through someone turned up and were like. You haven't got permission to do that. You haven't got, you know, a, a thing for that. You know, you haven't put a sewage thing in here. Like, you Mate, know. I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, carry on. Go, yeah. So, year, so add to year one, right, of this great, because that's bringing back all these memories. I got this, the fun fair people, who are lovely people. Yeah. I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> so fun, they, uh, fun fair <laughs> people, yeah, yeah, so, that's a good term. So, yeah. so they brought all the dodgems, they brought all the... yeah. Spinning if you want to go faster, all the rides. Yeah. And there was just one ride come down from Manchester and uh, he travelled a long way on the big trucks. So he had arrived like three days before and he set up. He didn't set up till the day of the festival. So he set up this thing called a reverse bungee. And it, it's, if you could imagine, you've probably seen it, you sit in a cage and, fire it and up, fires yeah. you up into the sky. Yeah. But it's got these two huge poles that are probably 60 metres in the air. Yeah, yeah. And it fires you up the bungee cord. Yeah, you're in a yeah. cage Does it fit on two cranes or whatever they yeah. do it? Like, and it fits in the middle like of the proper, proper, <laughs> Yeah, proper, horrific, horrific. Expensive, yeah. horrific thing. Yes. I remember on Saturday morning of year one to add some more pressure. And we were all in walkie-talkies and I don't like to be on the walkie-talkie. I said, if you really need me, I got my phone. I always put my phone on, on uh, vibrate. And ring, so I get all these vibrates. I was in the middle of doing something, finishing off the site, and whatever. Ring, ring. Everyone wants a piece of you. Da, 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 signing off with councils and signing. This is. It was like all these text messages going. Dodge. There's someone here to see you. Urgent, urgent. I was like, shit. Something, so something serious here. And I was like, so I went over there. Two coppers, two police, uh, airport control people, because it's right next to Bournemouth Airport. And they were like, <laughs> mate, if you don't take that down in 30 minutes, we're closing down your whole festival. I was like, no, 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 he's come down from Manchester. It's fine, surely. They were like, J trust me, take this down. They were telling me, we were locking this festival down straight away. I was like, oh, my God, where is he? So I went and found the guy, and I haven't seen him before. He's a new, new guy. Went there, six foot three, gold rings, a couple of teeth, tattoos on the side of his face. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, mate, I don't need this right now. Yeah. My, but trust me, I've been told by this, you've got to take it down. He was like, I'm not taking that. I've travelled down from Manchester. I'm not. We had this argument. I was like, it has to come down, mate. He said, if it comes down, I want three grand. I was like, I haven't got three grand to give you. I'm not taking it down. So we had this massive get back and forth, back and forth. Anyway, after about an hour, he took it down with the police around him. Took it down. And then <clears throat> I saw the truck move and I was like, please go, please go out the site. Please leave the site, go back to Manchester, go back or whatever. He didn't. I saw him, I clocked him. And he was walking around the site looking for me. And I said, I've got 300, before that, I said, 300 quid for you. And he was like, nah. 
And that was, well, it was like a Benny Hill thing again. I was hiding in that tent, looking around the corner, <laughs> running and running, looking around the corner. It went on for about two hours. And then in the end, I saw his truck go and... But yeah, that's that's. And never any more. You had never, 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 never heard of him whatsoever. Jesus, hope he hasn't got a podcast, isn't it? No, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a lovely fellow, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, you're saying that now. <laughs> Don't fucking backtrack. It's, that's, that's the networking yeah. you learned as a kid. Yeah. Oh no, he's fucking terrible. Toothless. Uh, he was a lovely he guy. He was though. a lovely fella. Right. So but yeah, but there's loads of stories because again, I was learning. I was learning. No one's teaching me. I didn't have a mentor. No. I didn't have anyone to say this is how you do it. I was just doing it. You know? Have you got have you got a team now? Have you uh, yeah. how's it progressed? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. About... Oh yeah, prog- yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a team of ten full time staff. We have eight hundred staff every day at the festival. You know, it's a big operation. It's a big well oiled machine now. Um, but yeah, you know, that's from year one. We're coming into year fourteen. You know, it's grown into a into an absolute beast where people have teams are flying in from the rugby playing country, Hong Kong, your Dubai's, your South Africa's are coming in. Got 400 competing teams all coming down from all different parts of the UK. You know, it's wild. And and that became your number one thing. So so it turned out from being the biggest risk to you basically... I mean, how close were you to losing it all? Uh, it wasn't an option, mate. Fine. It wasn't an option. It wasn't an option. And the good thing is, big sponsors were coming on board. You know, we had massive international sponsors coming on board. Your Nintendos, your Carlsbergs, your Heinekens were fighting with the Carlsbergs, wanting the deal. You know, there was Adidas were coming on board. These big brands were coming on board because they knew we were onto something. They could see. We'd invite them all down year one. They could see. They're like, wow, I get it. And then, because you got to remember, I was selling my dream. Yeah. I was selling my dream to these big sponsors and, and people buy people. Yeah. You know? Has, is, um, have you now gone and ever referred and, and you know i told you you spoke to melvin have you actually changed anything now or or, or what were like what tweaks from day one to to, to day 14 do you know, or year 14 year, year 14 just improvements just more and more of everything just better of everything the experience when you walk in from the security being polite and happy and nice to then meeting our team as you walk through as you get a, uh as you get like a, a program and you come through and I'll speak to everyone and I go out my way to speak and making sure that all the bar staff are all there, the 300 bar staff are there, being polite to everyone and, and creating a wonderful big top dance tent and getting big acts into DJ um, and just everything, mate, to having glamping tents, to having jacuzzis everywhere and just creating an experience where people are like, this is amazing because I've done most festivals around the country as a as a customer, I've gone there, friends of mine who own them, I go and experience them, but... You will never beat, you will not beat the atmosphere and, and the, the buzz you get compared to Bournemouth Sevens. Have you, has anyone ever tried to copy it? Is yeah. That... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, that's, that's, that's always going to happen when you... No, I, I, there's always, like, they always say, like, kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a form of flattery because you're, you're the pioneer. Has anyone got close to re- replicating or is it still a poor man's Bournemouth? Or... I, wouldn't like to, I wouldn't like to say it was a poor man's Fine. Bournemouth, but there's, 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 a lot of people come there you got to remember, they come there and go, cool, we can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you start adding up, when every, everything adds up, you might be someone... Listen, there was there was an Edinburgh, there was a Leeds, there was a London, there was a Cardiff, there was... They're all popping up everywhere. Fine. They're not about anymore, bless Fine. them, because they don't... You can't just do it. You've got to be a proper promoter. Yeah. You know, you've got to know events. And I've put on a lot of events over the years, and that's my world promoting events and creating brands and, and, and dealing with big sponsors and getting sponsors over the line. And that's all part of the business model. Whereas a business model from a, a nightclub, you have one revenue stream and that's the door money yeah. as a promoter. Whereas you go into a, a festival, you have six or seven revenue streams from ticket sales to VIPs to glamping to camping to all the big catering bespoke units coming in to sponsorship to the bar. You know, so you were in charge of all of that, and we keep everything in house. You know, and if you were going to give anyone, if you were going to give people three tips for kind of doing events, doing that stuff, what would be what would be your three lessons that you've learned that are super important? I think you've obviously said about being a promoter first and foremost, but what else would you say? learn your trade? Learn your trade. Anyone as an entrepreneur, become an expert in your field. Whatever you do, just become an expert before you start trying to juggle loads and loads of balls. Focus in and home in. You know, don't take no for an answer. Never take no for an answer. For my world, don't take no for an answer. It just means not yet, you know? And make sure you're passionate about something because I'm passionate about events. I'm passionate about sport. I'm passionate about music. I'm passionate about making people happy and creating fun experiences for people. And, you know, I've had a, over a million people buy tickets off me over the years now. And 
I'm pretty good at what I do. I love what I do. Um, but you can't beat passion in something, you know. You know, I'm thinking about it the whole time. The whole time I'm thinking. And it's only when your subconscious tells you, what are you thinking about now? You're like, oh, you're thinking about festivals. <laughs> you're thinking about, yeah, what we can tweak and improve yeah. and who you're going to bring there and what DJs and what setup and how the movement of people walking around the site and then creating a, a forest party and what's that going to feel like and what time the DJs are coming on. And, you know, it's, you're, you're constant. How do you think it can get better? Like, where, where do you see it going? Just tweaking again. Tweak it. Just, for me, that's what I do is tweak and improve. You get to a level where you've, you, you're so happy, but I don't sit on my hands and go, oh, I've made it. I'm constantly improving. I don't want people to come there for two years and go, oh, I've done it for two years. I want to look at another festival now. You know, the amount of repeat business we get of people going, I've done all 14 years or I've done seven years on the bounce. You know, and that's repeat business. And in any business model, that's a that's a good sign. Whether you're selling clothes, whether you're selling sportswear, whatever, whatever you're doing. I love that. I love it. Because you know what? I, when I, I'd i heard about the Bournemouth Sevens, right? And everyone always asked ask me, but I was always playing. I was always that's on right. tour. So yeah. it, was, it was never an option. And I'll be honest with you. When I came down to see it and I DJed at it, it could not have been further from what I thought it was. Now, that was no disrespect for you. I, I, I obviously I mean a mate a couple of times you've spoken, but never, I'd never been involved. I thought it was like every sports tournament. I thought it was like one marquee, a couple of beer tents, <laughs> a bloke with a tannoy, you know, team, you know, uh, Wellington College to Team Five playing, right? You know what I mean? I, I just, I thought it was that. Oh. But to turn up and actually find a proper, legitimate rival to any music festival and a sports festival with yeah. how nine state eight stages nine 12 stage? festival arenas 12 festival arenas but i'm talking like proper stages you've gone all out with the look the feel it's yeah. it's insane is there anything that you've looked at so obviously you started and you said you didn't look anywhere else but is there any festival around the world we were talking offline about tomorrowland and actually bizarrely there's some stuff that you do that's quite similar to Tomorrowland, that kind of almost fantasy, yeah. different fantasy stages, the different characters that each kind of arena has. Is there anything that you've looked at and think uh, that you've drawn some uh, inspiration from now you've been going for so long? Oh, yeah, 100%. So so Bournemouth Sevens is always the last bank holiday in May every year, apart from this year, obviously. Yeah. We moved to August bank holiday. But for for as soon as that's... I'm the first, festivals, first festival of the whole season, so then I'll get the whole time off afterwards I go and do my homework at other festivals for three days go to Glastonbury for two three days go to Secret Garden Party go to the old best of all go to you know but 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 go as many festivals as you can and all if I go there listen I go there to party and have fun as well but if I go there and get one idea and I can bring it back and tweak it and improve it from that experience to add into our festival that's worth its weight in gold so the festival stuff is not the only thing you've done you've 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 set up a clothing range do you want to tell tell me about that because obviously again you know you what you're selling timberland tops you decided to make your own <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that was in 2010 in fact 2008 we launched Bournemouth 7 2010 we decided to create a sportswear brand called viper 10 um again went in just went in just went all in for it and invested uh, quite a bit of money on that brought even more pressure on because we're trying to make the I, I knew in my mind I needed to have two businesses I needed to have two in case one went down I've got something to rely mm. on um, and we wanted to beat the business model of what the sportswear industry is at the moment where you know they, they would uh, they would have people on the road selling you know what we were doing basically we saw it as a bolt onto Bournemouth Sevens we had 400 teams there how can we give uh, amazing kit to all those teams? They all turn up with all their branding on, da, 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 and they would design it online. So we saw Nike ID, where you design your own trainers online. We thought, why don't we do it for kits? So we thought we created this online uh, kit designer, 3D online kit designer, where everyone in the country is like, oh my God, this is amazing. So they would design their own kits, it would come through to us, and we knew our competitors would take 12 weeks to turn around all the kit from China. So when we were doing our R&D for a couple of years, looking at China, Pakistan, all these countries, we found this one factory in Lithuania, and it was four weeks turnaround, landed on your door. That was a game changer. Mm. So then you think 400 teams wanting all their kits, spending a couple of grand each, three grand each, 400 teams of them, it became a business instantly as a bolt-on to Bournemouth Sevens, and then after that, it grew into its own big business, which we built up uh, for eight years, and in 2018, I got a phone call saying, is that uh, Roger Woodall? Yes. It was a random mobile number. Um, I've been watching you for three years. We'd like to buy you. I thought, Chris, is that you? My best mate. <laughs> in the piss, you know, yeah, literally. Yeah. And um, yeah, eight months. We've done a deal over the phone. I said, if that's the deal, I'll do the deal with you. Shake your hand. 
and uh, done a deal. And the deal I wanted was 100% earn out. So I didn't have to spend two years with them, three years. It was literally we'd done the deal. Six, seven months of lawyers' letters back and forward and, and solicitors and uh, accountants and what have you. And then the deal was done, sold. Because I think I spoke to you around that time. I remember you called me up to ask me about DJing at the first festival, around maybe 2018, must have been metal, maybe yeah. slightly. And I remember you telling me, oh, I think, you know, we're going to sell this clothing range. You told yeah. me a bit about yourself. Uh, any regrets selling it right, no. move, right time? No, mate, gone. No emotional attachment whatsoever. I'm an events man. I just saw an opportunity that we can create a quality business here. You know, again, seeing being a pioneer and seeing a gap in the market. But yeah, I've done that and done with that. And I remember in the in the contracts then it said no complete cause, no complete cause in there for like two years. I was like, mate, whacked that up to twenty years. I've got no interest yeah. in doing that again. I've done that and we've we succeeded in it and we've moved it on. And now you've gone into kind of podcasting with the eventful eventful entrepreneur. Yep. Uh, do you want to tell people a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, due to COVID. You know, obviously we lost our festival last year and that was a massive kick in the plums, Hask. I want to talk to you about that, actually. Tell me about the podcast. I want to come back to the, yeah. the festival because that obviously, I didn't touch on that and I think it's fascinating. So tell me about the podcast and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the event stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically last year, uh, Boris spoke in uh, March 2020 and said the, the pandemic's on its way. Um, COVID, Corona, all these words were coming out and it was going to peak on Bournemouth Seven's bank holiday weekend. And this was two months before we'd sold 30,000 tickets. This is two months before. We're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? So we moved it to the August bank holiday. And in that moment when Boris spoke, I thought, I need a new business. I need to create a new business straight away. Because over that first month, I was on Google, I was on YouTube looking for new businesses. What can I do? Da, 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 da. And then come up with the idea of, you know, everyone was saying to me, create your own personal brand. And I've kept myself private for all my life. So everyone's like, you need to go public. You need to tell your story. You need to do an Instagram account. Why don't you do a podcast? Put it under your name. And I was like, I feel uncomfortable putting it under my name. So we've created a brand called The Eventful Entrepreneur, which fits me nicely. So, um, yeah, we you launched... You should have called it Pound a Man. Pound a Man. You should have that Pound a Man That's more appropriate, yeah. <laughs> that Pound a Man's kind of grown to different yeah. Pounds a Man as the year's grown. Um, but, yeah, so did uh, launched a... Basically, I just told my story what I was telling you now, I guess, and told my story and put it out there on a podcast and opened myself up and everyone really liked it. I was like, Jesus Christ, why don't we carry on this podcast? And so I've got friends of mine, yourself, mm. Barry Hearn, loads of faces have all come on, Harry Redknapp, and the list goes on and got them all on and the podcast has flown. It's gone really, really well over the last five months. I've thoroughly enjoyed having proper chats with people like this, but me being on the other side interviewing and... Uh, yeah, that's, that's blown up and people really like it because it's telling you about entrepreneur stories, you know, nitty gritty, not making a big, beautiful thing of it, telling the proper stories of what fucked up, yeah. what went wrong, what went right, how you did it. Tell, Just say how it is and people like that. So, um, yeah, I was doing that and literally did that for sort of eight episodes, nine episodes and then got a phone call one Sunday night again. Someone got my mobile number. Is that Dodge? Yep. Uh, my name's da da da. I, I put on. I'm the executive producer for I'm a Celebrity. Get me out of here. So I was like, he said, can I come and see you tomorrow? I was like, yeah, mate, of course you can. This is only a couple of you know a few months back, or whatever. Anyway, we got chatting, come down to the offices, and then said we listen to your podcast, love it, love it how you how raw it is and how you are and with people. And would you like to be the co-host to the new show called the uh, Harry Redknapp Show? I was like, you're fucking joking me. Yeah, of course, 100%. Like, is it Chris again? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chris, I was like, is that you again? But no, it was literally that. And literally the next day, there was in, in our studio, there was me, Harry, who's a good mate and a quality bloke and fantastic. He's a legend, He's yeah. a ledge. And Frankie Lampard. <laughs> the next week, a couple of weeks back, was me, Harry, Piers Morgan. Next week, me, Harry, Sir Rod Stewart. And it just goes on and on and on. And we've, we've had an absolute blast. How have you find you actually said you kept yourself private? Now you're front and centre on a show presenting. I mean, how how you found that? I've loved it, mate. I've loved it. I've got. I I don't, I don't plan it. I freestyle it. I just, I just. Again, I love people. I love asking questions. I, I I'm a, I'm a curious. I'm curious. You know. I'm. I want to ask questions. I want to find out about people. I want to dig a bit deeper. You know, and ask the questions that maybe people don't want to ask or scared to ask or whatever, you know. So, mate, I've really loved it. And it's been perfect in this whole lockdown. It's been really therapeutic and been able to chat to the most amazing people. It's like me and Harry kicking each other on the table going, 
we're interviewing Piers Morgan, like the biggest <laughs> interviewer worldwide, you know, and it, mate, it's been great. It's been I, I love that. Just going back to the, the thing about the festival, because I forgot, obviously, that because, you know, COVID's been around for such a while now. You get that call, you see Boris is saying that, you, you hold it. I mean, do you, did you lose a boatload of cash on it? Were yeah. people receptive? Because I know you, there's, I, I won't mention their names unless you want to, but I know you've had some legal stuff that I want to come on to. You've fought some big battles. Just tell me, first of all, what happened when you tried to pull a pull a festival from the edge of actually starting? Yeah, yeah. Uh, roller coaster? Because you got to think, I've been working 4,000 days on this festival, 13 years, and then to be told we've got to move it, so when you when you got when you move a festival, you just can't move a festival. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. You got to speak to the police council, licensing the venue, and then you got to tell all your clients, all the all the people have bought tickets. So we, because we're a nimble team and we're entrepreneurial, you know, and a lifestyle business what we've created with ten full time staff that we can move quickly, you know. So then we moved it to August, and then we told everyone, told all the people who bought tickets, saying we're moving it, it thinking, oh my god, this is a nightmare. And it was at first. It was like Ping on my mobile, info at bournemouth7s.com. Ping, ping, ping. I want a refund. I want a refund. On Ping. This went on for 14 days. Oh my God. I was like, oh, my God, this is a proper nightmare. What's going on? Anyway, 14 days was up. We added it up. 80% of people had kept their ticket for August. 80%. And only 20% wanted refund. I was like, this is amazing. But at the time when you're receiving all these pings, you think, yeah, yeah. You think it's a lot worse than it actually is, you know? That's like so, actually, that's quite a nice example of what social media is like. You get 10, 10 negative comments, you think it's 10,000, you think everything's falling apart, you yeah. get 10 pings, and, you, and all you can focus on is that. But actually, yeah. you're right, 80% is brilliant. Um, unbelievable. Then I, went, I spoke to my other pals, and they were like, they were only 20% of other festivals, you know? They only 20% moved on. So we've got this massive loyal following, a lot of love for the festival. So that was nice, but the, I pressed... For me, it was always that dangly carrot. There's a lifeline for the August one last year. Come on, Boris, come on. What's going on? There was emotions, but Boris and his his doctors were fantastic. And yeah, was, we're going to get through this. And then it, the next day it was like, oh no, everyone's, there's a massive problem around mm. the world. Oh, no. So it was like this. And when we had to pull it, it took me personally probably about four or five days to make it public to the country and put it out there across all socials and do a video and say, we've lost the festival, you know. Thanks for all your support, but... It was emotional, mm. you know. That's your baby. That's my yeah. baby for fourteen years and thirteen years. Sorry, um, and you lose, and you know, there's no investors. We haven't got to answer to a board. It's me and my wife who own the festival. You know, we're a private company. We kept everything private. Have you have you managed to do that? It's yeah, all mate. just oh, room. What amazing! Wow, hundred yeah, percent, mate. So, so that leaving JP Morgan turned out to be in the end yeah. an all right job. <laughs> yeah, she thanks me now. Fine, but at the time in eight, nine, and ten, yeah. she, she won't thank him. But she was she's a great support. Yeah, Great it sounds person. amazing. Yeah, actually. she is a proper superstar. Um, I've been with her for eighteen years, and yeah, she's a, she's an amazing woman. She's financial director of our group of companies now, so she, so yeah, she's happy now. But at the time, she, you know, <laughs> yeah, risk averse yeah. from Wales, living in nice countryside, to marrying me and going on this journey. That's you know? a roller coaster in itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, as long as you didn't turn up with a monkey and a parakeet <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah, cock a two, cock a two. That's <laughs> the one. Jesus. Um, yeah, but so, but did you? So you kept the fa- you kept the the fans the eighty percent, but was there people that you've been working with for these last thirteen years who got the right hump who, who now who who pulled the plug on the festival or demanded money and you were like I can't you know did you lose any uh, relationships? Do like you know that? what the relationships got stronger? Oh really? Yeah, mate. The events industry was disjointed, and all of a sudden the whole events industry came together. So you got to remember if you pay if I paid deposits because I was only we had to cancel it, you know. And then everyone's got a deposit. So you think the marquee company's got 30 grand deposit. What you call it, it's got 40 grand deposit. Someone else got 60 grand deposit. You're thinking they could actually keep those deposits. All of them have moved them over to this year. Wow. For 2020, all of them. So the relationship has got even tighter and stronger because everyone understood. Um, the police were brilliant. The council were brilliant. Bournemouth Council, BCP, love what we do. Because we bring millions of pounds worth to the local economy that weekend, you know. Hotels, taxis, food, da 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 you know. So... Yeah, it was interesting. And, but you know what? And Fleur and I, we lost a lot of money last year. But I was okay. Because you know what? I knew a recession was coming. And I knew a recession was coming last time, 2008. I knew there's, it's the land of opportunity. And that's why we did Bournemouth Sevens. And that's why we did Viper 10 Sportswear. In a time where most people would curl up in a ball. So I knew what was coming. So that's why we've created what we've created now with the new uh, the events course 
online events course. Yeah, tell people about that because that's yeah. amazing. Because again, seeing the opportunity, it's teaching people how to do what you've done. Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. So that's given me time. I was like, I've got time now. Use the time and say, what can I do? I was looking for this new business. And I thought, after about a month, I was going to all these rabbit holes and da da da. I was like, everyone's earning loads of money on online courses. Where's the events online course? Not much competition. Hold on a minute. Why don't we do an online events course? So we've created a brand called the Event Crowd. And what we're doing is that for the next generation that we're pulling together 40 of the events industry experts who have put on Boardmasters Festival and, and uh, the Olympics and, and the marathon and other festivals and events and big massive weddings and smaller weddings. And we brought the events industry experts in and created a course. And we've worked on that for the last nine, ten months now. And we're going to be launching that course in September this year. Um, and the way I saw what the opportunity where I saw it, Hask, was I saw that car companies were constantly improving themselves. I saw that watch companies were constantly improving themselves and tweaking and improving their brand. I saw that universities weren't moving with the times. I knew that these young 18 year olds getting taught to go to university by their teachers at school. I knew they were going there. They were spending £9,000 a year on tuition fees, £27,000 over three years, <laughs> and losing and leaving university with 50 grand's worth of debt after their food and, and partying and, and housing, etc. So as a 21-year-old, you're leaving, going into the big wide, big wide world with 50, G's around, 50 grand around your neck, debt, before you even start business. I was like, this is wrong. I knew that event management students or sports management or business management students were going there being taught from a lecturer who's reading from a book from what was written 20 years ago about events. I was like, hold on a minute, there's a massive gap in the market. I want to be the pioneer now that I can get this next generation of 17 to 30 year olds. We can teach you everything you need to know about events and a business in a box if you want to become an events person from how to create a brand, how to um, market it at an event, how to plan an event, how to sell an event, how to put an event on, how to deal with... Uh, leadership, how to be entrepreneurial, and we're creating this online course. And it's just been rubber stamped by CIM, which is the Chartered Institute of Marketing, allows us to go global. So, you know, a £2,000 course that you can do in three months, or go and do a degree and come leave 50 grand's worth of debt, and you've done three years. Don't get me wrong, uni's a great fun. Mm. You know, you go there, you're on the beers, you're having a laugh, you're meeting friends for life, you're learning how to be an adult, etc, etc. But I just want to give people another option. And basically what we've done, we've, we've solved a problem. Because there's a massive myth out there that you have to do an events degree to get into the events industry. Yeah. And you don't. What we can do is we can fast track you. Come and do our course and we can fast track you. Technically, you only just need to be brought up in a pub selling hot dogs and ice cream <laughs> to get into the events, <laughs> events business. Selling tickets to nightclubs Selling tickets to nightclubs for £2 and you bought tickets for £1, I think. And Timberland hoodies and fucking, you know, go to higher ministry of sound for five grand plus someone's nothing but a hurdle called back. That's how you do it. Yeah. But you know what? I, I like to keep business simple. Yeah. And I just want to give my knowledge now. It's giving back. I'm in my 40s now, early 40s. It's like giving back saying, hold on a minute. Business doesn't have to be complicated. But I'm going to teach you everything you need to know to get into the events industry. Whether you want to do your own events or not, you're going to have this piece of paper to get into the events industry, to go to the owner of an events company in Manchester or Birmingham or London or a, a wedding company and say, I've, I've, you know, I've done... Have you put a pathway of progression to work for you for the Bournemouth Sevens, like some graduates you 100%. would look to employ them under and, and your guys? 100%. We employ lots. Well, there's 800 staff over the weekend at Bournemouth Sevens. 50% of them are Bournemouth students, you know. But it's, it's the accessibility. There's no one I don't know in the events world. It's the accessibility. Once they've done the course and go, I can phone someone and say, hey, I'll, this girl or these group of girls have done it. Could you get them in for a, in for a chat? Well, you've got to remember, you finish a degree. Most people have got a 2-1 or a first. Mm. As an employer, I don't care whether you've got a degree or not. You know, I'm after emotional intelligence. I'm mm. after someone who's bang on the ball. I'm someone who's sharp. I know someone who's have a laugh. I know someone who's got a great attention to detail. Yeah. The simple things. I can teach you everything else. Yeah. You, have you got the right attitude? Are you passionate? Great, come in. You've got a job. Let's go. Well, I think that's fascinating that you've you've done all that stuff. Um, has kind of, you talked about moving with the times. Talk to me about kind of social media and stuff. You know, how, like for some people, you started in a kind of an old arena and now you've come in... Like, 
do you see that as a real benefit now? Do you think it's made the events world easier? Has it made things worse because you're constantly under scrutiny? Everyone's got a camera phone. Like, how do you find the modern technology helping you? For business or for yeah. personal? For, well, I find for, for business, for the events world of business. For business, it's been phenomenal. Phenomenal. So in 2008, imagine I've done 10 years of fly a poster in, getting the word out, farmer's fields. All of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg lands Facebook on my lap. I'm going, there you go, mate. This will make life easier for you. I can sit on my bed and press buttons and build groups of people back then and groups of people and get banned from Facebook because I'm going under different names. I keep building. I spent all my time on Facebook. I was like, I don't, leave, I don't have to leave my house and I can promote to all these people. This was phenomenal. It was a game changer. Huge game changer. So you weren't a technophobe. You, you, you see these things and oh, you're like, I'm mate, into it. I'm in. I'm in for business. Mm. You know, I was in. I was like, I need to know more. How do I build, how do I build more numbers? Because it's a numbers game business. Pure numbers game. Especially my business. Mm. You know, so that I wouldn't be where I am today without social media. We wouldn't have sold Viper 10 Sports without social media. We Bournemouth Sevens wouldn't be as big today without social media. You know, with your Instas and your YouTubes and, and everything else that goes with it. And So, yeah, amazing. But for me personally, I, uh, well, I've just come on it five months ago and we created the Eventful Entrepreneur Instagram account, the Eventful Entrepreneur uh, YouTube channel. We're going to be doing the TikTok with... Obviously, please don't do TikTok. Well, I've, I've got a couple of <laughs> no, <laughs> fuck get out of my studio. <laughs> fuck it, yeah. Listen, no, mate, I'm a shit dancer. No, I've got shit, two left feet. I, I've I'm seen shit, your two left I'm feet. I'm a shit mate. dancer, and I'm not four years old. I'm a 14 year old girl. <laughs> and half those lads, if we, if, if, if every time you post a TikTok video of you dancing, you instantly blew up. The world IQ would go yeah, up by a million it would percent, be, wouldn't it? There's a, there's a bloke, I don't know if you've seen him called All Right Fans. He's on social media called All Right Fans, All Right Fans, and he, um. He goes on, he does videos, he's TikTok, and he's like sitting there going, who the fuck are these two? And he's like some emo bloke, is he's like posing the shirt off, and he's like, mate, he just tears them apart. I can't yeah. believe, like, he goes, whose kids are these? Fucking come and pick, come, come and collect them, <laughs> come and pick them up. And the dude was like, it's got to be something different though. Yeah, I'm not going to go, I'm going to no, fucking dance. No, and no, shit. I know. But it's got to be something on there where I'm teaching, but in a fun cool way about events and festivals yeah. and entrepreneurship and leadership and just and making it a way that the younger generation are seeing it like wow this is pretty pretty cool business model you know has it made you make the the, the festival even more visual because you know everyone's gonna be posting yeah. instagram yeah do you ever go have you gone along the influencer thing have you got you know getting people to look like they're having the time of life and post it at no. the event or just organically happens no no, no i'm not into that mate <laughs> I, like, I like to i like to get people there Fine. like yourself like did i like to get people there and them say it themselves like mate genuinely this festival's amazing. Yeah. I don't have to say anything to them. Yeah. They're genuinely saying that. Fine. And it's different when someone's going, yeah, it's really good here compared to like, you've got to see this, guys. You know, Because you know restaurants and businesses now are designed the whole thing around being Instagrammable. Yeah. So you see on the menu that they're offered to take a photo of the food. You know, waitresses now deliver this kind of smoking, flaming thing. And they're like, would you like a photo for Instagram? I just wondered if you've put you know instagram spots or posts or made everything yeah. so aspirational there's a lot of color at our festival yeah. it's a huge amount of color you know and we pride ourselves on that so then there's also big b7 signs where people are taking photos next to and uh, lots of different signs and, and and flying flags and color everywhere and just amazing lighting in the trees color it's just very colorful as you know you know, when you came down and played in... What year did you play? I can't remember. I can't 19. Remember. 19, yeah. 29. Do you remember? <laughs> Mate, that was madness. Oh, remember walking? Remember you walking through the crowd? It yeah. was like, I'd never seen anything like it. I know. It was like you were mobbed. I, I, like, do you know what the weirdest thing like... was? Because well, the weird thing is, is that that's my demographic of people, yeah. bizarrely. And thank God I had Chris, the big security guy. Yeah, he was good, Because that one he? guy was steaming, tried to knock me in the fence. <laughs> Chloe was getting mobbed by his girls. He had, at one point, he had some bloke up by the fence, had Chloe by the <laughs> scruff of the neck, and was up like, pulling me through the crowd. But I couldn't believe... Yeah. I, honestly, because I don't want to underplay this and talk it up more than it is but I went there and when you took me to VIP mate just to see Nuts, oh, like 4,000 people and that, was just, whole, that was just in the VIP that's what I mean and the whole <laughs> place went off and I remember and I remember you were really tensive because because you did you, I don't know, we always joke about this because you, you were like fuck me I can imagine you going who are we going to book and someone's going to James Haskell you fucking Haskell he's not a DJ he can't DJ and you were like on me before going listen you need to play this music and I know you you maybe listened to a couple of SoundCloud stuff or I was a bit more techie or a bit more stuff and you were like don't play this don't play it. and you were like on me and I could feel you fucking there and I think first song I played Free From Desire and and it just went, went nuts, didn't off. it? Off. And oh, then mate. I saw you visibly because you were filming everything yeah. else, like, looking, and you just went, 
<sighs> yeah, relax. Because I thought you thought I was going to come on and start playing some Carl Cox like, techno. Everyone's going mad. No, <laughs> mate, it was fucking. It funny. was. It went off, mate. Oh Fair my god. Play to you, mate. Fair I love. Because you know, before I was a little bit nervous. Thinking, yeah, of course. Oh, How's he going to come on these? What is he going to? Mm. And I was like giving you the tug, going, mate, I don't want to hear that hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, has yeah. got to be. This has got to be tunes that they're yeah, going to love. Yeah. And I think you thought that I thought that. I was booking like fucking Paris Hilton or remember you <laughs> yeah, said to me yeah, you were like yeah. you said on Just my pod on press play <laughs> I thought because I've had that I've DJing clubs. I remember I, I was DJ, DJing a club in um, in Bristol, and I, and the, the resident DJ was on, and he came up and I was doing a backspin, doing this, the three decks on a go a cappella, and someone and he came and he went, oh, you can actually DJ. I was like, what the fuck do you think I was going to be doing? But everyone thinks that. Yeah. So I remember I remember physically. Yeah. We've always joked about it since because I saw yeah. your body language. You were like this dancing. It went off. All the fuck. You're like, yeah. okay, yeah. now we're yeah, going. Good. It was yeah. good, wasn't it? Right. Oh my god. I, 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 but I, you never, loved it. Oh my god. Do you know what? I messaged Tom yeah. Curry today. Yeah. Um, oh, he come down. Yeah, and I said to him, listen, I booked for Bournemouth yeah, again. Yeah, quality. Right, last weekend of... Uh, oh, sorry, a bank holiday weekend. It's not, what is it, August? Uh, this year, it's the last bank holiday... Well, it's bank holiday weekend in August. Bank yeah. holiday weekend yeah. in August. I said to him, I'm going to be there. I expect you to be stage side. But you know, he was trying to set off a fire extinguisher at one point. What's he? I was DJing, and I remember looking <laughs> over, and Chloe was getting him drunk, and he turned around, he had a fire extinguisher. I was like... <laughs> I was like, Chloe's probably told him to set off a fire. Yeah, I was like, don't yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. set off a fire yeah. extinguisher. Um, Mate, he had, a, he had a he had a three day session. I think he was meant to be there for a day, and then I was like, he goes, I'm loving this. He had to stay three days. I remember the last day, his voice was just there was nothing. <laughs> yeah, he was like yeah. miming at me again. Like as if to say, Dodge, I'm loving this. <laughs> I love it, mate. Um, yeah. So, so what, what's next for you? Like, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the festival. But what is there anything that you've really got a burning desire to achieve and do? Um, the event crowd, the new business, which is the events course. That for me could go global. It really could, and that's what my energy has been on the last nine months and the next, you know, until we launch in September. So, and obviously we've just been given the green light from Boris that the festival's going ahead and Bournemouth Sevens is year fourteen. So the energy levels have risen up again. It's just, and I'm doing the podcast. You know, I would never have been in this position if it wasn't for COVID. I would never have had the event crowd and the events course and the, the two podcasts with Harry and my own podcast, Event for Entrepreneur, and doing Instagram and YouTube channel. I would never have done that. Hmm. I'd have just been well known, but not publicly yeah. known, well known, yeah. but oh, everyone knows Dodge or whatever. It, but now I'm putting myself out there and I'm really, in, I'm really enjoying it. Well, I, think it's, I think you've got a fascinating story. I, mean, I just, one thing I want to know, ask you before is do you think. Um, or are you prepared for a different kind of festival? Just I wonder because I hate. Obviously, I understand why we're doing the mask and the social distance stuff. I'm a hugger. I don't Same. want. To be, I don't want to be socially distanced. Same. I don't want to do that. Are you having to put loads of things in place, or do you think by the time we get to August, we'll be in some sort of normality again? I think we'll be back into normality, mate. Fine. They've got to. They can't keep carrying on. They can't keep carrying on like this. No. You know, if if the festival season, the festival owners lost another festival season, you know. There's a lot of festivals out there don't make money. Yeah. Just because they got amazing big lineups, don't think they're making money, you know. So if you lose a festival and they lost a second year festival, the world, you know, and weddings. Yeah. And everything, sporting events. Yeah. Sporting occasions. Everyone wants to be out. You know, we're the British people. We're sociable people. Yeah. We want to have beers and have fun and have a laugh and and dance and the way I've seen tickets fly between myself and all my friends who put on big events or even smaller events. Everyone is chomping at the bit to get back and have a party. Yeah. But I just wondered whether you... Because I, I, I said to Chloe, she, my wife, she, she wants... To, I know you know, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Just my reminding her when I was my <laughs> wife. Um, it's just... I've spoken to her, she said about going on holiday and want to go stuff. And I don't want to go and have to do a weird social... I DJed at a social edition uni event. And, and while it was great to get out and DJ, they were in pods... 70 oh, people in this giant club in pods. Every time they got up, security told them to get down. And obviously the whole point is the DJs, you want people on their feet. Yeah. I don't want to go back to that. And I think, I know COVID's terrible. We're trying to save lives. But I, I said before that obesity is the biggest thing that's going to fuck up the NHS. Yet we're so worried about COVID. COVID's going to pass, but nobody's doing anything about it. We're not clapping for fucking obesity, are we? We're not changing the way we do things. We're not doing anything True. like that. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, I think we, we get, we've got bogged down in this. I don't want to go to a festival where I have to be socially distanced, no. wearing a mask. No. Fuck off. How'd you do that? That's what I mean. But I wonder you if go... you've, you've, you've got any mandates to do all that or... Mate, how can you get 30,000 people or, or go to another big festival with 80,000 people in front of the main stage on Sunday night and 
You just like you just can't. Yeah, they're all like that, and they're yeah. all. T- t- you won't. Everyone's no. four pints in. Everyone's gonna be loving each other. <laughs> yeah, you know what other. I mean? Unless someone's <laughs> licking your face, you're not having a. You're good... not having a good. No. Yeah, you're having a good time. Where can people find out more about if they want to follow your stuff? Is that you know got one website or? You know? Yeah, well, you got bournemouthsevens dot com website. You got the eventful you got eventful entrepreneur across all the social channels and the YouTube channel, and we're cutting up all small little videos of great pieces. We're just do- we're doing something different and really fresh, uh, and I'm really. I'm really a massive, I love entrepreneurship and I've got people who I mentor, other entrepreneurs, younger ones, I'm giving advice on, I love it. You know, I live and breathe entrepreneurship, that's what I know, that's, you know, I'm not trying to be anyone else or do anything else, that's my events and entrepreneurship, you know, so yeah, catch me there. Mate, listen, it's fascinating, well guys, Roger, you were brilliant. Roger, Obviously, you've never called me Roger before. Sorry. <laughs> this is so formal. Like, Dodge. Isn't it? <laughs> Dodge. That was brilliant. Um, thank you, Matt. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, you've got the uh, Eventful Entrepreneur, Instagram, YouTube. Um, you've got the, um, what's the name of the thing? Something Crowd? again. Uh, the Event Crowd. Uh, event Crowd yeah. that people can sign up to. That launches yeah. in September, does it? Launches in September, mate. That's super exciting. Anyone, anyone who loves events and wants to get into events, just Take a look at it. You I'm kind of quite fancy doing it myself, yeah. actually. Not that I want to get, I want to get into DJ into events. Yeah. So yeah, but um, but listen, mate, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming in. Right. I really enjoyed that. I, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know what to expect when we went through this, <laughs> and it's been a a roller coaster. I've seen the uh, Gareth, the technicians, be laughing his ass off at some of the stuff. So thank you guys. Thank you, Roger. I mean, Dodge. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> uh, I love it. Mate, I thoroughly enjoyed that, mate. Thanks, man. Thanks Appreciate for inviting it. me on. Thanks well, on. guys, that was what a flank of the podcast series too. I was joined by uh, Roger Woodall. Um, <laughs> that's such a formal name. If you want to find out more, then remember this is a YouTube show. Uh, it's obviously a podcast. You can pick it up at all your, your usual podcast places. I'll be back with many more guests. Catch you soon.